how are you guys doing now this might be a very long video we're gonna be going over quite a lot of things for not only texas this weekend but for all the 1.5s coming up for all the things coming up in the month of june and july like we have dover kansas darlington charlotte gateway coming up iowa nashville pocono indianapolis michigan and then you know at that point we're, we're at the cookout southern 500 in, in the playoffs and stuff but like this is the good part of the schedule and this is where I typically want to spend the most of my my time focusing on for the NASCAR DFS season. Um, so yet again, we're not only just talking about Texas this video, but we're talking about the intermediates in general and, and quite a lot of other things. So I apologize if this is long, but listen to it on 2X, uh, listen to it at the gym, on, on a walk, whatever the case may be. I even got, you know, real classy, uh, super classy shirts on. Uh, shout out to all my Mass Effect fans and stuff, uh, just because I think this is one that you might want to watch or re-listen to or even pay attention to, uh, not just for Texas, but as we move on into um, the different races this season. Now, I am going to talk about first Texas itself, not just related to DFS, but where Texas is and ha where it has fallen in the schedule and the importance of this track. Okay, now, as everybody knows, I have quite a lot of connections and... and uh, sources in the NASCAR industry that work for either SMI, that work um, at tracks, uh, in terms of officials, that work for teams. Uh, we're, throughout the entire industry, I have, I have people that I can talk to and trust that I have been, been for years. When we look at Texas specifically, not looking at DFS-wise, the reconfiguration for this track has been a pretty big disaster. Now, we haven't heard publicly anything about the Texas reconfiguration. It's all been rumors. But where I stand and where I feel, and the main reason why I didn't go to Texas this weekend in person, because I'm like three and a half hours away from it, uh, is because I'm under the impression, now this is me uh, listening to uh, a lot of what I have heard from them. Nobody's come out and said it, because right now, truly, they don't exactly know, okay? Uh, the, people give NASCAR far too much credit for knowing what they're doing, especially SMI in general. Um, where I'm at, is that Texas gets reconfigured after this weekend. The main reason for that is two things. Is one, they need the year to get it reconfigured to have it back in the playoffs for next season, okay? And the most likely situation is to take what worked at Atlanta and move it to Texas, okay? So I'm sorry if you don't like that type of racing, but that would be amazing for Texas. That'd be awesome. And it's, it's going to pack the stands, okay? That is what I am leaning towards, this race being uh, the final race at this configuration. I could be wrong. Uh, I haven't necessarily asked in recent months of this, but all this is information that I was hearing uh, very much in early March, February, and even last year. Secondly, when we look at the schedule for NASCAR and the TV deal coming up after this, we should get the NASCAR schedule much earlier this year than normal. The reason being is because the TV contracts or the TV, uh, the what is it, not the TV, uh, the providers, how they're uh, wanting to break everything down in terms of what tracks they want to cover, in terms of advertisements. Because right now, especially in, in, in March, April, May, all these TV networks are selling advertisements for next year now. You know, they're, they're saying, oh, this is what we're going to have to offer. This is where we're at. This is what we're going to be doing. Oh, we're taking on NASCAR this year. And so this is the time of year that we're getting those advertisers set up in place for next year. So we should have the schedule way faster this year than, than in previous years, just based on the TV deal. Because of that, we don't know where the dates are going to be for any race right now. I don't know it, how familiar you guys are with like season tickets and stuff, but there are tracks out there selling season tickets, reselling season tickets, Land Motor Speedway being one of them, but there are other ones that are like, hey, you know, I know we got a second race going on, but do you want to renew your season tickets for next year? We don't know the dates right now, and they're probably going to change slightly. Um, but that's where we're at in terms of like this grand scale scheme of, of where Texas is falling in the schedule and where it is just important in terms of NASCAR. The reason I'm bringing that up now is because we have technically all or we've technically we have had Texas be in the playoffs late in the season and it's been more so a track that has aligned with like oh this is where these people have been good at uh, driver A, B, C through H or whatever has been good at Las Vegas, Dover, Kansas, Darlington, Charlotte, all that throughout the year. And they line up for Texas. This is s removed from how Texas is falling in terms of like DFS, in terms of the chaos and stuff like that. Let me go ahead and bring this up now. 
So when we look at Texas, now this is Las Vegas, but where we look at Texas, and we'll even talk more about 2023, not 2023, 2022 and 2021. The reason being is, yet again, this is going to be a very long-winded uh, video talking about many aspects of the intermediates and where Texas falls in line at. Um, when we look at Texas in terms of the schedule, as I said, it has taken a lot of data points that we have seen from following races, not just last year, but when we look at where drivers have been, we're, yet again, we're not talking about DFS at the moment. We're talking about drivers, but not necessarily pertaining to how we're building lineups for this week or whatever. Um, if we go back in time and we go ahead and look at the, yet again, 2022 is where I'm at, where I lean towards looking at recent data because we had so many different winners and this was the first year of this next gen car. Yes, we had very much, you know, the same teams and the same types of people fighting for the win. We see, and this is just looking at wins column and stuff like that. And it was still primarily Joe Gibbs and Hendrick, but um, the wins and, and a lot of the stuff did spread out. Like we even had Harvick win at races and stuff like that. And so for me, if, for using this example, I'm selecting this data point and actually removing it to make my point. When we're looking at where cars are falling in line at, in terms of where they are, in terms of speed and consistency at the 1.5s, when you look at 2022, I understand this is an old car and this is not the data point that um, we're using to build for this week because this data is useless. But looking at trends of how everything has typically gone throughout the seasons, and where those cars and those teams have been fast and where they end up um, running at these tracks. When we look at 2022, this was the year that DFS players uh, either, depending on what side of the coin you were on, depending on what side of the coin you were on, you were either like, man, we had a fantastic year or we got fucking screwed and, these, uh, and, and the people we were playing quite bad uh, got extremely lucky, okay? And so when we're looking at 2022 and we look at where these teams were, yet again, we're not looking at drivers here, but we're looking at the trends and identifying that this, these data points carry through and we'll bring it back towards Texas here. Yet again, that's why this is a Texas slash intermediate preview. As we look at where these cars were, and yet again, we're, ba we're for this example, we're just looking at the finishing position. We could look at driver rating, but I wanted to just look at this because I can fill in the blanks of where we're at. But we can see that for the most part, we're seeing that Hendrick was dominant right off the right off the bat. We see that Kyle Busch was leading laps coming from the rear, um, and we see that the two main teams competing for this were Hendrick and Joe Gibbs in terms of the cars that they had to offer at this time. As we move throughout the year and we see the improvements that Joe Gibbs had, as we continue to go through, yet again, who wins this race? Who was up front because people ran to issues? This was Chase Elliott winning the race, leading. We had Ross Chastain lead the race, finish third. We had Bell, we had Bowman, Larson, Kyle Busch, Martin Truex Jr. We basically have, yet again, the same teams. We have Hendrick and Joe Gibbs running up top. Now, if you're just looking at the stats here, you're like, you know, that that's nothing crazy. But if you remember where we're at in terms of this race, Denny Hamlin has the fastest car, drives up through the field early in the race, gets the lead early from... Um, the lead like I mean we're seeing that Denny Hamlin in this race you're telling me this guy starts second you know he jumps up to the lead pretty much right off the bat at a track that is very difficult to pass leads a lot in this race runs up front and then gets involved in not one but two wrecks ends up going a lap down with Cody Ware spinning in front of him we see that hey Denny Hamlin had a ton of speed at Dover hey we're seeing that Joe Gibbs had a ton of speed here at Dover, specific, specifically in traffic, okay? Yes, they weren't able to necessarily run away with the race. We see that, you know, we run to issues with Kyle Busch, basically takes over where Denny Hamlin was, leads a good portion of the race, just doesn't get the finishing position. We see a lot of the Hendrick guys move up there. But as we see, as we're taking data points of like, man, who's able to pass? Who's actually able to do stuff in traffic? And this will bring back to, or this will go back to what we saw last year and kind of where these data points are pushing towards. Well, where we're at in 2022, we see, man, you know, there's a lot of things that we saw in this race. Dover's a one-groove racetrack, very difficult to pass, very difficult to have a good car in traffic. The Joe Gibbs cars are able to do that. We continue to go on through, uh, I opened this twice. Oh, man, did I? I clicked the wrong thing. As we move into Darlington at the end of the year, 
Yet again, who was fast here? Who had true speed? Who was running good in this race? You know, and we see that the people who started up front, the people who had speed, the people who were leading laps, we see Denny Hamlin, yet again, mid start, starting middle of the pack, gets up, leads laps, and then gets involved in another crash, another wreck. A very easy chance that Martin Truex Jr. runs away with this race, starts first, gets involved in a wreck, leads laps, and um, just runs into issues there. We see Chastain also run into issues. We see the third Joe Gibbs car, who not only had a situation to where Denny Hamlin led laps, ran into issues, fell off. Trix Jr., or, and I mean, I'm, I might be, because this isn't yet again a race that was like two and a half years old, but we basically see uh, the Joe Gibbs car. Okay, so Kyle Busch takes over first, leads, runs into issues. Okay, who takes over after that? Another guy who's up front, Joe Gibbs. Martin Truex Jr. gets up there, runs into issues. Diddy Hamlin, very much middle of the race, able to have the fastest car, very much going to take over the race. We see Hamlin and Truex swapping lead back, and then they both run into issues and wreck out. Okay, and so we're looking at this race here to where, you know, this race was pretty much dominated by Joe Gibbs. Like, those four cars, those, and specifically Truex, um, Kyle Busch, and Hamlin, were like the class of the field. The only reason we have Logano leading laps, the last basically 107 laps, to basically the end of the race, is, and I could be wrong, he may have been battling with these guys specifically, he may have started up front actually. Uh, let's see exactly where Logano led laps here. So we see him lead, uh, basically, you know, probably coming out of the yellow or right before the end of the stage, actually competition caution rather, and then we see Logano uh, still getting past and battling with the Joe Gibbs cars. Logano then takes over uh, at lap 95, which is coming out of this run here, uh, coming out of the stage, and then past that, uh, either due to strategy. And basically, like, strategy is only going to work if you're in a position to take over the lead, very similar to, to Byron taking over the lead last week in Martinsville. Basically running fifth and fourth all day takes the lead on pit lane. You can't just take the lead if you're not running up front. Anyway, so we see a situation where, man, Truex... Hamlin, Kyle Busch, Joe Gibbs is pretty fast. They are the dominant team. They have, they have legit just ran to issues. So if you've been chasing this stuff in DFS, you've been getting screwed, basically. Like, it just, it's just the variance. You've been playing the best team, and they've all been running issues. As we can as we continue to go along through Kansas, yet again, look at who wins this race, okay? We have the Toyotas very much up there. We have the um, Hendrick cars right up there. But this race, and you look at who is leading in this in this event, um, you see that Kyle Busch, and it might it might not be this Kansas race if I'm thinking correctly. One of these, this so this is the early year, uh, or early in the season, and so we're coming off of I may have skipped. So this is the first Darlington race. So next week we enter Kansas. We see that the Toyotas are very fast. We don't get into a lot of issues. We see 2311 showing up like they're not running issues. Well, it's still yet again primarily Joe Gibbs and. Hendrick. And so this is the first race to where we haven't had a ton of stupid stuff happen. As we continue to go throughout the year, we look at the Coca-Cola 600. This is a situation where, you know, you remember Chris Buescher flips. We have basically 17,000 yellows uh, running into issues. We have Chastain, who that may have been the year prior. I think it was in the 42. Um, blown engine, so that, that is not this race. Anyway, like, I promise I'm getting to a point of where we're at in an intermediate related to this year. Why? I'm leaning towards certain data points. But we're seeing that Chase Elliott is up there leading. Same thing with William Byron. When we look at these two, uh, their average rank position while they were in the race, they were up front. They were into issues, and we just started getting a lot of yellows and stuff. And then at the end of the race, basically, Hamlin, who, who basically loses the lead at the very start, he starts on the pole, doesn't even lead early. We see him lead from 3 to 9 and then fall back through the field and then doesn't take the lead back over again until late in the race. Um but yet again, maintain a running position inside the top like 10 all day, just truly lost the lead. And so who was chalk here, started on the front row, everybody played him, and he ends up working out because the entire field dies. Anybody who was able to um, beat him runs in issues and stuff like that. And then Austin Dillon causes another super crash uh, that brings us into the final um, green light checkered. Anyway, I promise I'm getting to a point here. When we start looking at this race here and we continue to go through, hey, who's up front again? It's the Hendrick guys. It's the Toyota guys. And as we continue and as we go back to a race that people were um, very much racing in or 
a race to where the data point very much showed to go back to Kansas later that year, who has the lead? Who leads a majority of these laps? When we look at this and how it ended with a, uh, I believe, oh, we go to the end here. We go to the end of the green. So yet again, another good representation of just where these guys were in terms of like this race ends under a, under green. This race has a, has a 96 lap green uh, run to the end. Who's up there? It's the Toyotas clearly ahead, and then it's uh, Hendrick, which basically 2311 and Joe Gibbs is basically the exact same team. We all we all know that it's. And when you look at it, Hendrick having four cars, Toyota basically having six. That's your top ten cars practically. I know we have Chastain popping through. I know we have Ryan Blaney coming through, but we're seeing that there's two clear teams at this stance. Um, I may be thinking of the race last year. Anyway, so that was 2022. When we're looking at 2021, let's go ahead and X out of all this stuff, um, which I might have it as the, I don't. So when we're looking at 2021, and the reason why I'm, I'm showing you this is because it's not based on the drivers. We're just understanding, because these this is you know four years ago, five years ago, whatever the case may be. But we are able to understand that there are teams that are clearly showing speed that are clearly able to um, run up front, that are clearly consistent throughout all these races. And, and when you look at it like a, like a bar graph or like a, I guess like a stock portfolio or something, you would, and you look at it over the years, um, whereas, what side am I on? So this side would be present day of like Toyota and Joe Gibbs, and, or Toyota, or Joe Gibbs and Hendrick, and we see Hendrick kind of taking the fold of passing them again, and... Um, as you move on, you see the Toyota was ahead and stuff like that. But we're seeing that the trends are showing that if you're good at these intermediates, it doesn't matter if these are concrete. It doesn't matter if they're high bank, low bank. It That stuff doesn't matter, okay? We've, we've been through this song and dance enough to understand and see that the cars that are going to be fast at these intermediate tracks are, are just going to be fast, okay? So everybody knows where I'm at, but if, uh, like, I personally don't want to hear from anybody being like, well, we can't look at this race here. We can't look at Kansas related to Texas. We can't look at Dover related to Texas. We can't like, we can use all of these data points. You know, when we look at this race here, opening year or opening the race here at Homestead, you know, we see a hey, who's leading laps yet again, kind of going back in time. So Toyota had cars and caught up to where Hendrick was in 2021. So if we're working back, we're going to see that Hendrick, was the more dominant team and we saw that toyota was uh farther down it takes them about a year to catch up or a year to take over or whatever the case you want to be but it's still hendrick and toyota at these intermediate tracks okay the top 10 has basically been the exact same it's just that we see this year is the year that you know larson just absolutely destroys the field uh and is the best car consistently week in and week out but we're still seeing the same guys up front okay we're still seeing you know it's basically Joe Gibbs and Hendrick battling back and forth. And yet again, you know, Harvick just being, you know, the G he is, the real double G, is is able to maintain a uh, position there. But we're seeing that, like, Hendrick is just killing the fucking field, man. Killing the field. Oh, what's that? This is how Hendrick performed at Dover in 2021? D murdering the field. Absolutely destroying the field. Hey, next week at Charlotte, who's, who's murdering the field? Who's being up there? Oh, my God, it's Hendrick again. Holy shit. Like, so we're seeing, when we're looking at intermediate tracks, and I mentioned this in, in one of the previous videos earlier in the off season, or right when the season started, but we want to look at this in terms of, like, all these data points together, and we want to be aware of where these people are, okay? Now, related to Texas, it has been in a uh, precarious spot in the schedule. And so when we look at these races here and why it's been so crazy... Okay, we're going to look at the last three Texas races here. And yes, for like truck series, they go like just absolutely negative IQ. The Xfinity series, they just love to wreck stuff. Like I would, if I was going to a race this weekend, I would actually prefer the Xfinity race because I could probably watch more crashes in person. Um, but when we look at Texas, okay, and I was there last year, okay, I was there. I got to hear all the racist chants. I got to hear all the N-words that people were yelling at Bubba Wallace, okay, when Bubba Wallace just destroys 
Kyle Larson absolutely right hooks him just like just like Sterling and Dale Earnhardt. Bubba Wallace is like, nah, Kyle, you're not gonna win this, and just throws him into the fence. You know, I got to see all that. You know, and you're like, what are you talking about? Bubba, Bubba just Bubba was on his outside. Kyle Larson got loose. I don't know about you, G. I don't know what you're watching, but I saw an intentional wreck by Bubba Wallace towards Kyle Larson. That that's what that's all I saw, and that's all the crowd saw too. But when we look at where Texas is. Yet again, it's been in the playoffs, so this has been a very important event. Like, this is this is uh, stupidly important. And so these teams are bringing the best cars. You know what data points they've been bringing? Everything that they have found at the other intermediate tracks that we would see, and we've seen very similarly, those cars have been the faster cars at, at Texas. Okay, yet again, when we look at last year's race, we have Larson basically running first all day. We have Bubba Wallace being the car that can compete with him. Okay, we see that, I mean, Bubba Wallace basically takes over the lead after uh, Larson just kills himself and stuff. And we see a, quite a, a lot of yellows. And realistically, outside of outside of these incidents here and and, uh, and Suarez stopped on the track, I mean, these were one-car incidents. These were not major crashes until we had the big crash on the front straightaway. This race had a real chance of going green, man. Like, these cars are not even near each other. Okay, when we look, and uh, I can show this on my own, I can show this on my own video, at least hopefully, I don't know, hopefully, uh, hopefully these fellas, hopefully YouTube doesn't yell at me, but, I'm going to mute this, so this is the crowd reaction to the people's champion Kyle Larson taking the weed from Daryl Bubba Wallace Jr., but I want to, I, I, like, TV doesn't do anything, or it doesn't show you, because they're just fucking zoomed in towards, the, they're like, what's that? We got to see the sticker headlight of the lead car. What's that? There's like 30-something cars on the, st nah, dude, let's, let's just zoom in. But this is, so this lead is where Kyle Larson takes over from Bubba Wallace here at Texas last year. And that is right, I got to, no, I got to figure this out. This is before we are at 1, 23, 5, 12. I don't know what number that is, like 142. Um, that is, I'm going to assume that that is right here. So let's see, or it's 142 left. Uh, two laps, so it's going to be probably in this range here. So Kyle Larson takes this lead, so that, that is 142. So we see that Kyle Larson takes the lead from Bubba right here and leads toward to the end of the stage, uh, which is right here. Okay, and so we are deep into a run. You know, I mean, this is like, you know, where we, we've survived the restart chaos. We've survived anything stupid, um, anything early. like this is where these cars are running. Okay, and when you look at where these cars are running, there is like no car beside themselves. Okay, we have several car links and you cannot pass at this track you cannot pass at this track this was the why why is the crowd going nuts because like you just can't pass at this track it's insane you just see people far and wide that's why that's why i call him white power larson man because like i have never met a racist who hasn't liked kyle larson like it's insane look at this crowd cheering for larson what the, like but you you just you just cannot pass at all at this racetrack. And so when we're looking at Texas, we're looking at a track that is gonna be very dependent on where you are in terms of speed, uh, of where you've been at in this data set, which we'll look at this shortly. And that's just last year. Okay, when we look at the twenty twenty two race, uh was this the past the all star. So this was actually following the all star race. And we see that, I forgot what chaos happened in this race, if I don't remember correctly. But we go green, uh, basically have the yellow just because one guy is, I'm at Talladega, whoopsie. I was like, what the hell if I look at it here? This doesn't make any sense. Um, when we look at the, if, I, if it'll load, um, and we see this. Now, this was a, this was a lot of, one car instance, a lot of people run into issues. What happens in this race here? Well, this should be the race that, yeah, Truex uh, cuts a tire down. We have a lot of people who are going to be up front leading this race, okay? 
and we look at where the where they were in terms of now yet again this was 2022 first year of the next gen car we had a lot of teams where a lot of people drivers winning but the same people who were up front competing for the wins week in week out were taken out in this race okay by single car instance by flat tires running issues things of that nature okay and so when we're looking at the chaos thing the last two races yeah sure we've lost the pure lap leader of larson last year okay and then this year we had a lot of incidents with tire issues and people running issues and cody Ware almost dies and gets a concussion and stuff like that when we look at 2021 and you look at texas and where that fell in line and you look at who was up front in a race that if i believe yet again a lot of just one and two car instance here but who was up front hendrick and joe gibbs okay same guys week in and week out main reason i'm bringing that up is since this was a playoff race these teams were bringing the best of the best cars that they had to this race because clearly they're wanting to advance to the next round of the playoffs this is like go time you got to race hard and stuff like that okay so when we're looking at where texas falls in line this year yet again we're, we're coming out of the las vegas race and we've understood that yes the teams have brought their best equipment and everything that they've learned throughout previous years to this race i would lean towards this texas race lining up and syncing up with very much of where these guys are and the main reason why i'm saying that is yes like texas has moved its date but when we get back to dover after talladega when we get back to kansas charlotte we already know that we can use these data points here and so when we're looking at texas it shouldn't be a surprise we shouldn't see anybody else other than the toyota guys and the hendrick guys have speed here okay yet again when we look at where larson has been Okay, and let me make sure, I'm going to go ahead and remove, uh, actually, well, you can still see this stuff, and these are just the secondary guys from uh, the Las Vegas race here. When we're, when we're reviewing what happened a couple weeks ago at Las Vegas to where these guys should line up, like, hey, man, Larson is here. Yet again, if we were to have all this data points with everything I just mentioned from 2020, three even though you know we had a lot of new winners we'd see that you know generally you had the same guys be fast but yet again i'm just choosing to remove that because yet again we're not at the first year of this next gen car we're at a point where these teams very much have figured out the car uh these teams in terms of speed are very much lining up with where they should be like there shouldn't be any like super duper surprises or anything like that so when you line up this data on your screen and you can and you compare it with 2022 you compare it with 2021, you're going to see, yet again, that like kind of graph, uh, stock line, portfolio chart, whatever it's called, line graph, I suppose, um, would basically line up like this is where Larson has been, okay? Yet again, Dover basically had the best car at Dover, passed through the field, Rush just thing takes him out at Dover. Past that, Larson has been one of the best cars. When we look at Byron, okay, where Byron has fallen in line at, got debris hit a trash bag the size of Texas, okay, with a beer can in it, and still had the 11th best car, but had significant damage to this car. That's where Byron was. When we look at the Las Vegas race, okay, and we're looking at, this was interesting. When we look at what happens outside of pit road issues, Kyle Busch had a really, really good car at Texas, at, at, Texas, at Las Vegas earlier in the year. He ran into issues on pit road, not once, but twice. And that pushed him down to finishing uh, quite poorly to where he's at. But outside of where he was uh, due to pit road issues, Kyle Busch actually had a pretty decent car. Okay. Like pretty much like the third, fourth best car outside of running into issues on pit lane. Now, yet again, that's a bit higher than where we've seen Kyle Busch be at, but that is noteworthy. Okay. When we look at where, yeah, again, I guess we'll just figure out, we'll, we'll fill out where, where Byron falls in line. Like ladies and gentlemen, it's not because Byron won last weekend at Martinsville. It's not because of that. The main thing is is because Byron has been under-owned relative to where he's been at in terms of this green flag speed, in terms of his ability to win. Yet again, the storybook or the, the, the story and the examples that I just gave related to where the Toyotas were in 2022, if I'm not mistaken, if I don't remember the... I know we just went over the years, but 2022, 2021, I'm pretty sure it's 2022... Uh, we saw that the Toyotas were extremely fast, and they literally died at every racetrack, at Dover, at Darlington, at Kansas, 
and the ownership of those teams when you and I distinctly remember this because this is why this is data point that I'm looking at their ownerships were always under owned compared to their upside we're talking Denny Hamlin and both those races if I remember correctly the Dover race where he basically crashed with Cody Ware after he was going to lead the kill the field at Darlington both those races I believe he was like sub 20 percent and they had the best cars we, we we saw that Joe Gibbs was the most consistent and was just beat by Hendrick because they ran into issues, they crashed out. That's how you win DFS. That's how you play DFS. You play guys who are performing just as well, if not better, or the exact same as where the public is going, and you, you take that leverage play. And so, like, yet again, Byron, this last weekend was 20% owned, okay? I know, um, you know, Bell was basically around the same place, ran the issues, you know, finished three laps down, but Byron wasn't owned, okay? Now I'm not saying that because he won, but I'm saying that because Byron, we, we showed, looking through the practice data, we shown looking through the short track data, and now you can do the same thing here that, like, Byron is basically the identical play to Kyle Larson, okay? We understand that Hendrick, by and large, we can even see that Chase Elliott is, is, is coming back, you know, we're going to have to start. We, we are really going to have to start playing Chase Elliott. Same logic as if we like Larson. Elliott is right there. Okay. And so when we're looking towards this year of intermediate tracks, the next month and a half, two months, where do I want to be? I don't mean to just repeat the same thing, but I want to be overweight on Byron each week. I want to start playing more of Elliott. I was hesitant on playing him at the short tracks, but Elliott is going to be right there. Bowman is, is a real case of like, pricing um determining where we want him at because he's clearly the fourth like why is bowman even at this fucking team dude bowman fucking blows this guy is terrible like in terms of where yet again oh my god someone's gonna get mad because i said bowman sucks i'm just saying not even like mean larson look where larson is look where byron is okay look where elliot is okay and then look where bowman is Okay, not bad, living a better life than I am, but it's clearly the fourth Hendry guy. And there are several drivers out there who would be able to be right there with the other three Hendry guys if it wasn't Bowman in the stupid car. You know, when you look at where Joe Gibbs is and where Hamlin is, okay, Hamlin, stupidly consistent, truly run outside of issues. Like, And every every driver is going to run into issues. I mean, we're looking at a data point of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, if I count that right. 14 races here. You know, Larson had his one issue at Dover last year. Hamlin had two issues last year, or in these 14 races we're looking at. Outside of that, he's a top five contender. Okay, we look at Truex. Ran, to a, ran into just absolute horrendous luck in the playoffs. If you remember, Darling crashes out, blows a tire like on lap four at Kansas. Literally is stuck in traffic at Texas. Cannot do a damn thing this was not like um truly based on speed although he does uh spin out and is off sequence in terms of tires and have to start at the rear of the field due to spinning out doing to be due to being in a crash he oh hey i clicked on it correctly we see that uh he spins out here um excuse me <clears throat> and um and if i remember correctly there's a checkup or at the end of the stage or something People are checking up, and Truex has to slam on the brakes. I'm pretty sure it's at the end of the stage as well. And so Truex basically starts last in this race like three times. Um, and so the fact that he, like, finishes right where he started, like, some people are going to be like, ah, he fucking under he underperformed. He did terrible. Yeah, sure he did. But, like, when you look at the reasons why he was basically here all day, like, you know, that explains it. And so, or at least that you understand why he, he was bad in these three races here. But outside of that... You know, that's 11, 10 races to where he's been a top five car and certainly guaranteed a top 10 car, like just depending on where we're at. And so when we're looking at Texas and we're looking at intermediate tracks, we want to trust this data point where I'm at. And yet again, this is me um, sorting by uh, laps in top five, top 10, top five percentage pit road um, data points and where these guys are running in these races and stuff. And so like Kyle Busch, you know, if you look at his driver rating, Kyle Busch's driver rating is like 13th, 14th, 15th here. Um, but the points that I'm looking at, like understanding, like, yeah, he was there because of his pit crew. Yet again, 
pit crew, such a big deal, it doesn't even fucking matter. We cannot control these idiotic pit crews. So, like, I want to look at where these guys are in terms of speed. I want to look at where these guys are at in terms of competing with the dominant teams with the fast cars on the track. Okay, and if the pit crew screws them over, it just screws them over. That's how it is. But Kyle Busch had a pretty decent car at Las Vegas. Let's continue to go through the rest of the Joe Gibbs cars now that we went over um, uh, Hendrick. And so, yet again, we're seeing that Christopher Bell, we kind of cut the line and see that he's like the seventh best car pretty consistently outside of, you know, bad days. He's going to certainly score worse. He needs help. This is a driver who runs in a situation of where strategy will have to get him to be one of the better cars. Um, but that's where he's at. When we look at Ty Gibbs and where he has been, yet again, if I like and I understand that Truex and Hamlin are going to be fast and Bell is going to be up there, he's going to need some help to get strategy to get the win. But why don't I like Ty Gibbs here? Like, I'm not just here. Because some, somebody even said, like, you're just you're just playing Ty Gibbs because you like him. You just play Byron because of what? I don't give a flying fuck about any of these drivers. These are just data points to look at. I'm here to try and make money and help you guys make money. I could care less who is in these cars, man. It could be Mussolini and Hitler in these cars for all I care. And I'm just looking at the data points. That's all I'm doing, okay? So when we're looking at these cars, like, I, I would want to play Ty Gibbs. I would, if I like these cars if i like the hendry guys if i love larson man i should i should probably pl start playing a ton of byron i should i should personally start playing i should probably start getting more on elliot because he's leaning towards getting another win okay and, and being up there not it doesn't matter what he did at martinsville okay it just so happens that hendrick dominated martinsville like we looked at those data points and i said like hey man we, it, yet again secondly Looking at how races play out and looking at them past or once they're done can be two totally different things. Like last week, if, if you're looking at how live scoring is at in that race, like it's crazy that Larson had such a good day and, and was not optimal. You know, it's very rare that the most played driver in a race doesn't crash out, has a good day, and isn't optimal. You know, typically it's a wreck that takes him out. He was just forced out of the optimal lineup. We saw that optimal lineup change quite a lot throughout the day. Just looking at the top of the field, we had, you know, Larson in the 11,000 range, and then Hamlin takes over, and so it's a build that's like, well, you need to pay up for both those guys. You know, Byron comes from 19th or 20th, you know, and he starts getting into the top 10, top 9, top 5, and now he's forcing his way into an optimal lineup with both Kyle Larson and... Um, Denny Hamlin, we're having Bubba Wallace be optimal for a majority of the race because he's seventy-seven hundred dollars, scoring you know forty-four, forty-two points for a majority of that race. It's not until Elliott then takes the lead that removes um, Bubba Wallace from the equation. So it's then Kyle Larson, and Hamlin, Chase Elliott optimal with I don't remember who the value play was, but I'm pretty sure it was Gillen at that point because um, Lejoy runs into issues. And so that removes him, um, and we're at a point to where McDowell is also stuck in the back. We don't have Chris Bell or Chris Buescher moving up through the field yet. Bell runs to an issue, so that removes it a 10K. That removes a 10K driver who's able to battle to be optimal. And so at that point, you're battling between um, Larson, Hamlin, Truex, and Byron as your most expensive guys, seeing who gets in there. And then once Byron takes over, Byron is then optimal. They end up leading enough between Elliott, Hamlin, and um, uh, Byron to then f push out and price out Larson out of the optimal lineup. And so, like, I know I'm just kind of rambling here, but understanding how those lineups are playing out, understanding what situations and what builds are working and not working there, you know, it just so happened that, you know, Hendrick ends up dominating the race. You know, and this isn't a victory lap or anything because, you know, I, I only did three lines. I didn't land on Elliott. I didn't play Elliott. Um, but, like, being on 100% Larson, 100% Byron gave us a lot of opportunities there. And I know a lot of other people in the Discord played more laps and um, got very close to taking out a lot of tournaments in that situation. Uh, and so going back to, like, this type of stuff, I'm explaining what happened at Martinsville. I understand I'm saying, hey, I want to play the same guys – that we that just performed decently decently in Martinsville, and it's not because of that race at all. It's because of this data point we're seeing that these teams are going to be up there. 
Okay, and so the real question that we have to think about now is, and the reason why I went over the last years, the last, you know, very long roundabout, you know, we're, I'm 40 minutes into this, and now I'm now explaining why I went over the data points that I went over in the first 10, 20 minutes of this video, is because we have seen the last few years that the cars who have shown speed and the cars that are right in the top five, truly outside of Larson, and outside of the clear leader of like whatever team it is, like Hamlin and stuff, I guess related to this year, like when we look back, we saw that Hamlin tricks, we saw that the Joe Gibbs guys were underperforming the last year, the Gen C or under under owned compared to their upside. And they just ended up not working out. And we constantly see um, ownership, not reflecting the true upside of these drivers. Okay. And so when I'm looking at here, yeah, Byron one, does that maybe bump up his price or bump up his ownership? Possibly, but based on old, or recent trends in the DFS world, ownership is not going to be, especially this next month and a half, it's not going to be on um, plays that have similar upside to like the tier, like one driver that you would look at, like compared to like Larson and Byron, you know, Byron practically being identical play to Larson. We have seen time and time again, that exact driver Byron be under owned compared to what Larson is. Not even in that situation, but we've seen, you know, years ago, you know, that Dover, that Kansas, that Darlington race where Hamlin and Truex were the better cars. Those guys were like the third, fourth, fifth most owned uh, people in that. And you might be like, well, that's still expensive. But yeah, but when you have like the main chalk lap leader, you know, carrying anywhere from 30 to 40 percent ownership. And then you have. Hamlin and Truex and those guys and those situations being at like 22, 24, 28% ownership, like those people you want to be on, that's where you want to go because they're able to be there. Yet again, it, it didn't work out, but like game theory would show looking at past stuff like, man, we probably, you probably should have been on those guys because I know I was, but you probably should have been on them. And it was literally variants that didn't allow them to take down tournaments. Uh, and so when you look at, even when you studied lineups of a lot of these players who I have a lot of, um, not even respect, that's the wrong word, but like uh, Bixby, um, Sterling, STR, um, even Sheets in previous years, um, he has, they, these individual players, and I'm speaking to them just because they're in our Discord, but those guys have been overweight on the, you know, secondary and third, um, I guess like lap leaders and stuff. And they're not even like third and secondary or secondary and tertiary, like lap leaders. Like they have an identical upside compared to the main guy. And especially in a year like this where we have, yes, Larson has been here. He has been the best car, but he has been beat by his teammate, William Byron last year. And he has been fought with the Toyota guys. Okay. And so when we're looking at Texas, now that we've established that, when we look at Dover and we look at what is going to happen in the upcoming weeks. Okay. And so yet again, I don't want to hear stuff about, well, group A is faster. Group B is faster. It, we, I've already debunked that. I mean, last week is a clear example of that, but like these, this is the data point we're looking at. Okay. So it would be fucking shocking that like, if we see Larson have a bad practice because he's in a bad, he's in this slow group in practice or in qualifying, and then he isn't one of these cars. Okay, especially if we have the Hendrick guys separate in two groups and we see a discrepancy of where they are in terms of speed and practice and or qualifying. Based on this data point, we know that they are identical in terms of speed, in terms of upside. Same thing with Truex, Hamlin, the Joe Gibbs guys, the 2311 guys, we have them have a bad situation here or a bad practice session we we know where they're going to line up in terms of speed based on this stuff here okay now that we've established where we're at in terms of upside or in terms of being at the top of the field in terms of lap leaders because that's what really matters okay getting the lap leaders correctly uh, excuse me and arguing that same issue of you know if somebody who has been a top five contender starts 25th due to qualifying or the metric or something you have to project them for around 7th to 8th, and you have to give them 
um, respect that they are going to compete directly with the guys who are going to be up front. And it's just going to come down to do or does somebody up front underperform or not get the lead. And that's going to make uh, like place differential plays of these top guys. If they are in the teens, be a priority to me that that's uh, because they're not only do they have the upside to lead laps, but they have the baked in place differential that we are going to want in our lineups. Um, now that that's been approved or that's been looked at, the main thing, like there's been 40 minutes on just the top guys on who is expected to compete for wins here. What's going to fill out the rest of the lineups are very much where everybody else fits in line at, which is what I want to primarily focus on now that we've gotten over the um, the like lap leaders up here. So let me go ahead and pause this and grab the salaries for this Texas race. So we can just kind of look at to where we're going to end up building for this week. And I can't imagine things are going to change too drastically between now and Dover. And so that's why I think this video is, is very much evergreen, at least towards um, the summer months of this year. And it's evergreen in terms of looking at this data point in terms of 2025, in terms of 2026, in terms of things that happen in that situation. So let's go ahead and look at where we're at in terms of salaries for this Texas race and see where everybody falls in line at. All right, so we got the salaries here. And I could put it on, on this page, um, but I'm not going to for this because we've been looking at this type of stuff all day. Uh, I just want to focus on kind of the salaries here and talk about, like, let's talk about builds. And so we see that Larson and Byron are basically the identical play. They're the same play. Um, separated by $200, like, I would prefer Byron here. He's the same play as Larson. He's right where we're at. I like the idea of playing these two together because when we look at where, actually, yeah, sure, fuck it. We'll just put it on, put on this one here, and we'll just go through salaries here and kind of talk about where everybody falls in line at here for, did I get, okay, yeah, I got it up at the top, so... We'll just go ahead and put this here. And yet again, I'm sorry that we're like kind of overwhelming the thing, but so this is where we're at. Byron Larson just went over the same thing. That's why they're the most expensive guys in terms of where I think ownership will come through. It should be more on Larson. I would want to be more on Byron. Okay. When we look at Ryan Blaney, for example, like I see him at 10 2, I see him as like, I have truly no interest in, in Byron. Could be wrong here. Could be straight wrong, but this is just right now. I'm like, Pricing's correct, Pricing's correct, Pricing's correct, Pricing's correct, Pricing's correct, Pricing's correct. Pri mm. This is this 10 2. Not only do you have to build around him, he needs to jump up and beat these guys, which I'm not saying he can't, especially if he shows phenomenal speed in practice. So, this is where we want to look at like Blaney's practice speed is what we want to really dive into and understand. Okay, that's when you ask, What group is he in? What is the track state that he's in? What is he bringing in terms of practice and in qualifying? Because this is the true, like, not even unknown, but, like, we can see where Byron is compared to everybody else. You know, we have Larson, who's clear top. Byron's there. Hamlin's there. Reddick is there. Uh, Truex Bell. Like, but we see Blaney here, and I'm like, I have very little interest in Blaney. Okay, we're seeing where he's falling in line at. We saw where he was at at Las Vegas. Got stuck basically running – seventh sixth fifth all day like that's a situation where mm, probably not interested in blaney we're seeing bell elliot you know nine five nine two that's perfectly fine elliot being 93 that's very interesting to look at that's very interesting to see you know we see bubble Wallace, 87 ty gibbs bowman these guys in the ak range very very interesting plays just eyeballing it right now looking at kind of where we're at here um once we get to like kind of this range so we can kind of just highlight I just highlight the mid range and look at these guys specifically here because this is where at least for me projections will be based a lot on this stuff and we see where busher is and we see based on his price you know at eight thousand dollars he needs 40 points to even pay it off okay he needs 40 points flat out um and he most likely needs to start scoring probably 45 um 48 to really compete to be optimal um, based on where he starts. If he starts in the back of the field, his place differential, and we project him for like 11 tenths from around there, does he get there? Well, I don't know. I can't answer that right now because I can't even end my head right now. But uh, like if he starts like 16th, 
like that's like a no play. You know, we don't see a lot of situations where you can get there. Now, you might be like, well, you performed this way at Texas last year. That is true. But when I'm looking at everything specifically here of where he's falling in line at, like that, you have to go through and look at everybody um, in that range. When we look at Briscoe, like virtually outside of, like he needs to be a place difference play. He's pretty unplayable. You know, we look at Noah, you know, and we saw that Briscoe, Noah, like we saw where these guys fell in line at Las Vegas, which I think is like, yet again, that uh, line graph of where Stuart Haas has been, where they've been, like clearly last year. I mean, this was Gregson, another car, but like we understand that Stuart Haas is very much middle of the pack, yada, yada, yada. We're seeing that this year they are taking a step up, and we're seeing that graph kind of go up of where Noah Gregson should end up being at. But Gregson, in my opinion, would have to be a place differential play. If he starts like eighth or ninth, I understand he's, what is that, mid, mid seven, somewhere around there, 75. 35 to pay not 35 um might be like 38 or something 37 um if he holds his position here on the fringe of that if he loses any positions not gonna be able to do that you know Noah is a guy that i see as like a guy that i'd want to play if he starts you know in the 20s if he starts in the teens that gets very uncomfortable and stuff now when we look at ross chastain and, and track house so this is where chastain was okay and very similar to the Joe Gibbs stuff in the previous years, and I haven't mentioned Trackhouse yet because it's mainly been Chastain as being the main focal point of that team. Um, we see that Chastain has consistently been able to finish like 6th to 10th. Okay, He can battle for the lead at some points, but he needs to show that speed and practice to get there outside of you know regular, regular practice days. He's going to be like an 8th place car. Okay, the reason I'm bringing that up is with Daniel, significant step down. Yet again, sucks. Just terrible, horrible driver here. Just absolutely horrendous compared to what his teammate is able to do. We're seeing that he's fallen right in line of, like, outside of the top 10 cars consistently. Um, like, Soros has to show us something, you know? Has to get there. Uh, has to show us either upside of place differential or just a phenomenal speed. And that's not even, like, he's in the fast group and he has the best team, he has the best time. We would not only have to check that between what ha what he did in the group, we'd have to double check that with where Chastain has been in that practice, in that setup, or, I mean, it's not, we're not, we're not running the same setup, but what that team's been doing, and then cross-reference that with what Chastain has been able to do. And so, like, Suarez shouldn't see anything wildly nuts out of him. Jones, possibly, you know, Barry, possibly. Jimmy is just fucking... This guy is so old. Get Jimmy the fuck out of this fucking team. Let's see if Jimmy can actually finish a race this year. And let's see if he can finish a race this year without taking out his own teammates. Uh, we see where Nemechek is. You know, we see where Cendric is. We want to primarily focus on where he was at this year at Vegas. And then just look back and, like, okay, cool. Like, this isn't surprising because this is where he was at last year in this car. You know? And now the teams have kind of fallen in line. We've seen where everybody's running at. Like, that's that's where... Austin Dillon is, you know, this is where Michael McDowell is. And so McDowell certainly underperforming based on what his teammate Gillen has been able to do this year. And this is a bit concerning. So like yet again, if McDowell qualifies, well, <clears throat> like can't play him. I just don't see it. You know, I just don't understand. I, I couldn't, I can't fathom him like starting 12th and like contending up here. I, I just see like he, him, him falling back through the field. When we look at Ricky, you know, like this is where Ricky has been. Very, very dependent on where he starts and what he's showing. Uh, Austin Hill, we'll see. Hosevar, you know, LaJoy, like this is where this stuff gets really interesting. Because like LaJoy, you know, we've, we're coming off of a lot of short tracks that he's been performing bad at, but we see that DraftKings price is at 58. If he starts in the back of the field, he should gain positions. I think this is a situation where LaJoy will probably qualify probably like around 23rd, 24th. You know, that makes it very, very tough to play to play LaJoy. We see Priest, you know. So basically you just go through it and, and trust, at least for me, I'd, I'd be trusting the data point that we've seen in all these intermediate tracks. And I'm not, yet again, uh, I mean, at, at this point we're almost an hour into it and I don't have to go over like why we're using these tracks specifically because I've already done that in other videos. Most people already know where I'm at there. But like that's where Gillen is. 
you know, we're seeing call that person back later. Um, we're seeing that like Burton is here. You know, these, these are, these are really, really ugly plays. And, uh, the rest of the lineup, I can't even spell Justin correctly. The rest of the lineup outside of, because we've determined who has a real chance of leading laps, where these guys should fall in line, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The remaining like three to four positions in your lineups will always be determined on the grid. And then comparing those projections with everybody else, you know, from like seven, eight K down. Like that's why I personally have leaned more, more into like not really doing as many like preview videos based on these scrubs in the back or in the bottom of the salary, because that is going to just going to be depend on where they are in terms of projections. Once, once we have the grid, you know, I will say that, um, since we do have more cars this week, I am disappointed that we are not in the 4k range, which I thought we would be specifically, but we just have much tighter at the bottom 53, 52, 51. Um, so that'll be that'll be interesting because if I'm not mistaken, this is the most cars that we've had. Am I off one? Let me see. Nope. So this is the most cars we've had at a 1.5. At least in terms of the races last year, we got one more last year. Um, so if you're looking back at optimal lineups and you're concerned about salaries, if we're seeing situations where possibly cheaper guys are working out. Um, and or how much money we're leaving on the table. Um, yet again, if you're looking at it in a sense of where things should have ended up, maybe not necessarily looking at optimal lineups, because that'll be, at least for me, I don't know, like optimal lineups, like that ends up, you know, just once the dust is settled, once the nukes have been dropped, that's what ended up getting through and being optimal in terms of lineups. Um, but when I'm looking at where people should have finished or should have been based on how they ran based on what they're able to do based on pricing. Like that's kind of, if I was looking back at optimal lineups or looking back at drafting scores and salaries, that's the thing I'd not necessarily be hesitant on, but maybe acknowledge, and maybe I'm even wrong. Maybe they didn't have 4k drivers last year where they started phasing those guys out more. Um, but I would look more into like, are we double punting more? Like, Yet again, I call them shitters and stuff. I call the back marker shitters and stuff, but that's when they were 4K range. Now that we're at like 5K, like that's weird for me to say double punting in the 5K range because typically double punting used to be you would have like one guy in the 4K range and one guy in the 5K range. Now if you're playing two 5K, is that really punting? You're just you're just playing. It's not even punts anymore. You're just forced there on salary alone. And so when you're looking at where DK points might end up being based on salaries and stuff, you need to keep that in mind. Um, and I, I am kind of probably rambling here and we've been live for an hour. But that has been my video on intermediates, on trends, on the preview for Texas, and um, kind of looking for or looking forward towards the next month and a half of racing and the data points we should be looking at. And so if you hear anybody being like, we can't use, we can't use Dover, man, we can't. We can't use Texas to look at Dover, man. We can't look at Dover to look at Charlotte, man. They're not doing their fucking job. And that isn't even me talking shit like Pierce. That's just me being like, that is a that is factually inaccurate. That is an archaic way of thinking. Because we are seeing that you can use all these tracks to look at stuff. Okay? Whether it's high wear, low wear, doesn't matter. We're seeing the same teams compete at the intermediates, which is maybe why I like them more. I don't know. This is like real racing for me, man. I like the 90s. I like that we just had cookie cutters all over the freaking country, man. Like, I hate short track racing, straight up. I, I just want to see cars go fast, man. Um, and so that's that's where I'm at. Thank you for being here and watching this hour-long video, and I hope this helps you out. And I will see you guys in live shows Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. If you want to support me, support any of the work, I probably should have done this earlier, but you can join us uh, here at TrueDFS in the link in the description below. You can hop in the Discord, ask me questions, and use my projections, Sheets projections, and... Anything else you find on the site that might be useful? We have SaberSim. We have DFS or DFS projections for practically every other sport out there: esports, MLB, 
NBA, all the sports that are playing right now. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you guys in the next video. See you guys later. Well, bang, okay?